Nems. Welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. A survey conducted in 2009 demonstrated that there are around 4 million people in the US that wish to become famous. Fame is considered the dream. People feel like they've made it when they become famous. But really, is constantly being in the public eye all that great? Whilst there's the benefit of money and adoration of the public, when you're recognised everywhere you go, it completely destroys your privacy and opens you up to the possibility of being stalked. Being famous makes you extremely vulnerable. People know where you are and what you're doing on a daily basis. Constantly being in the public eye defies the human right of not being subjected to interference in your own home and privacy. Unfortunately, friends and family of Jill Dando know all too well of the disadvantages attached to becoming famous. Now, let me begin, as always, by telling you a bit about Jill Dando. I think it's so important to do this because it's super important to remember that the people we speak about on these podcasts are human beings. So Jill was born on the 9th of November 1961 at a maternity home in Western Supermare. So Western Supermare is about 33 miles from where I live and it's a fairly local beach spot for people sort of in the southwest, particularly around sort of Somerset and Wiltshire, which is where I live. Jill was a bright child. She passed two A-levels at her local sixth form where she was also head girl and then she went on to study journalism at Cardiff Metropolitan University. Jill was very active in her local community. She was a member of the Western Supermare Amateur Dramatic Society and the Exeter Little Theatre Company and she also volunteered at Sunshine Hospital Radio in Western Supermare in 1979. Right from a young age, Jill's dream was to be on TV. She got her first job in 1980 at the Western Mercury, which is a weekly newspaper in Western Supermare, as a trainee reporter where her father and brother also worked. After five years, she moved to the BBC and became a newsreader for BBC Radio Devon, which is based in Exeter and about 64 miles from her home in Western Supermare. In 1985, she transferred to BBC Southwest, which was also based in Exeter. Here, she presented a regional news magazine programme called Spotlight Southwest. In 1987, Jill started working for Television Southwest, which was a franchise holder for ITV for the Southwest at the time. In early 1988, she made the move from regional to national television in London, where she presented mainly the short on the hour bulletins that aired on BBC One and BBC Two, which was basically sort of giving the viewers the headlines of news stories. Jill went on to present a variety of TV shows including Breakfast Time, Breakfast News, the BBC One O'Clock News, the Six O'Clock News, a travel programme called Holiday, Crime Watch, and she occasionally presented Songs of Praise. In 1994, Jill moved to Fulham in London, which is about 138 miles from her family home in Western Supermare. It's while she's presenting these shows that a friend describes Jill as going from competent to being a star. She described Jill as in command, powerful, and said that she looked amazing. She also says that Jill was surprised by her level of success and that she didn't give herself enough credit for how amazing she was. Now, looking at pictures and videos of Jill, she really was a star stunning, elegant woman. She was just beautiful. Her cousin also says that despite the celebrity status, all the big events, all the awards, Jill's persona didn't change and she remained the girl next door. She says that Jill was sensible, nicely dressed and kind and that she never saw a horrible side of her cousin and that Jill wasn't too good to be true. She also said that Jill had no enemies. 
Jill was described by her colleagues as passionate. In December of 1997, one of Jill's friends set her up on a blind date with a gynaecologist, Alan Farthing, who, as of 2008, is actually gynaecologist to Queen Elizabeth II. When they met, Alan was separated from his wife, and a few months after his divorce was finalised, he and Jill announced their engagement on the 31st of January 1999, with the wedding set for the 25th of September that year. On the 25th of April 1999, Jill presented the first episode of Antiques Inspectors. She was then scheduled to host the 6 o'clock news the following evening. On the morning of the 26th of April, Jill left Alan's house alone and went to the house that she owned in Fulham, which she was actually in the process of selling. She reached her door at 11.32am, but she never made it inside. As she reached her front door, Jill was shot once in the head. Her body was found by a neighbour 14 minutes later and police were called at 11.47. Hello, ambulance. I'm walking along Galen Avenue. It looks like um, there's somebody collapsed. Um, confidentially, it looks like it's Jill Dando and she's collapsed and her daughter, there's a lot of blood. You just approach and check that there is breathing. She doesn't look as if she's breathing. She's got blood coming from her nose, her arms are blue. I just need to find out if she needs if she's breathing. Is the lady's chest going up and down? Oh my god, no, I don't think she's alive. Don't worry, I'm gonna get some help there so I can Jill was taken to Charing Cross Hospital, where she was pronounced dead on arrival at 1.03pm. The fact that it was Jill Dando, one of the most esteemed and popular presenters and journalists at the time, created an immediate, huge media interest. Jill's colleagues at the BBC News had to deliver the news to the public that one of their colleagues and friends had been murdered. Within the past few minutes, police have confirmed that the BBC television presenter, Jill Dando, has been stabbed to death outside her West London home. She died in the ambulance on her way to hospital. There are no more details at the moment. And that's the main news tonight, the brutal killing that today stunned everyone here at the BBC television centre. A senseless murder that leaves this newsroom in which she worked a darker place and makes a lot poorer the medium which she graced. Now, as you heard in the first news report, the injuries to Jill were so bad that for a while, police believed that Jill had been stabbed. Forensic studies indicated that Jill had actually been shot with a 9mm semi-automatic handgun with it pressed to the back of her head. Studies also found six indentations on the bullet casing found at the crime scene around the circumference and police believed that these indentations were used as a silencer. Jill's next door neighbour reported hearing a surprised cry from Jill, almost as if she was greeting a friend, but he never heard a gunshot. He looked out of his front window and saw what we now believe is the killer leaving the scene. He described him as a six foot tall white man in his 40s who was walking calmly away from Jill's house down Gowan Avenue. Now Gowan Avenue was just a normal residential street in London. It's tightly packed with terraced houses and there were cars parked on either side of the street. On the morning of the shooting, police reckon there must have been about 80 people passing through the street but the killer managed to pick the one time when no one was around to witness the shooting. Operation Oxbra quickly started, headed up by DCI Hamish Campbell, in an attempt to catch Jill's killer. On the 18th of May 1999, Jill's murder was featured on Crime Watch, one of the shows she was presenting before she was murdered. Crime Watch was an appeal show and they would feature cases that haven't yet been solved. Looking for murderers, burglars, people who had committed assaults and they also featured a 10 most wanted. 
It was actually axed in 2017 because it wasn't getting enough viewers and I'm still devastated about it three years later. Being a true crime lover, I loved watching it. The episode featured a reconstruction of Jill's murder and generated about 500 calls from the public. The reconstruction began just over an hour before Jill was shot. At approximately 10am, a postman delivered mail to Jill's house and noticed a man standing on the other side of the road, just watching the house. Then, at 10.08am, a traffic warden was looking for any cars that were parked illegally down the street. She went to write out a ticket for a dark blue Range Rover that was facing towards the end of Gowan Avenue, until she realised someone was sat in the driver's seat. Two minutes later, at about ten past ten, there was a third witness. A woman was driving out of Bishop Road, which was just one street over. She came out of Bishop Road, turned right and then immediately left to turn on to the start of Gowan Avenue. As she was turning right out of Bishop Road, she noticed a man who crossed the road and then walked into Gowan Avenue. She described that he was acting shifty and was constantly looking up and down the street, as if he was lost or looking for a street name. Then, as she got towards the end of Gowan Avenue, she noticed that at some point a Range Rover had appeared behind her and was right on her tail. She believed there was more than one person in the car, which makes me think, was the guy in the Range Rover waiting while the other guy walked up and down the street, staking it out? Or was it just pure coincidence and not involved in the murder at all? It appeared to the woman that the Range Rover was in a rush to get out of Gowan Avenue and it made her uncomfortable as she felt pressured to drive faster than she wanted to. A few streets down, the Range Rover finally left her tail and parked up outside of Fulham Football Club. Then, at 10.40am on Gowan Avenue, a window cleaner was at the house opposite Jill's and he also saw a man wandering around outside Jill's house. He described the man as having blonde hair with a smart appearance and wearing a suit. The other three witnesses also described the person they saw as wearing a suit, but the guy they saw had had brown or black hair. So was it the same person, or was the window cleaner mistaken? No other report from this or future ones report a man with blonde hair. I know that at some point a man that was witnessed at Gowan Avenue was identified and ruled out, so maybe this was the man. At 11am there was another sighting of a dark blue Range Rover on Gowan Avenue. A man was driving from the end of Gowan Avenue to the start and he saw a man standing between two parked cars. As he got to the start of Gowan Avenue and went to turn left onto Munster Road, there was a Range Rover parked right on the corner, probably blocking his view left but this time there was no one in it. Sometime after this, a woman leaving a friend's at Gowan Avenue also spotted a man with dark hair just standing around on the side of the road and she suggested that he may have been an estate agent as Jill was in the middle of selling her house at the time of her death. A further woman, at 11.29am, saw a man on the corner of Gowan Avenue about 200 yards from Jill's home and she described him as agitated and said that he was wearing glasses that didn't seem to fit him properly. Then, at 11.32am, Jill Dando was shot to death on her doorstep. On top of Jill's next door neighbour hearing a scream and seeing a man leaving Jill's, the man directly opposite at number 30 was coming out of his house and he also witnessed a man leaving the scene, but this time the man was running. At about 11.37, about five minutes after the murder, a man leaving a betting shop saw a man running across Fulham Palace Road from the end of Gowan Avenue. A woman who was driving north up Fulham Palace Road also saw a dark-haired man in a suit running for his life in the opposite direction. At about the same time, a van driver had to brake harshly to avoid hitting a man in a suit that just ran out into the road. Interestingly, the man seen running from Jill's house was wearing a coat, but when the witnesses saw the man running down Fulham Palace Road, there was no coat. So was it even the same guy? I mean, he could have quite easily taken the coat off and hid it in a bush. But the timings don't quite add up for me. I'm not sure how long Gowan Avenue is, but from what I can tell on Google Maps, there's roughly 110 houses down it. Jill lived at number 29, so he had about 80 houses to run. 
If he was running as fast as witnesses say, could it really have taken him five minutes to run the length of Gowan Avenue? I suppose it's possible that when he felt he was far enough away from the scene, he slowed down and walked for a bit and then began running again. Or maybe the witnesses' timings were off. Everyone knows that eyewitness statements are never 100% accurate. There's already been a suggestion that there were two people in the Range Rover, and if the Range Rover was involved in Jill's death, maybe witnesses saw both men running, one wearing a coat and one not. Police think that maybe one of the guys running, if there was in fact two different people, the one not wearing a coat was possibly a lookout. A woman walking through Bishop Park, which is where one of the men ran into, saw a man sitting on some railings talking on the phone, and when she walked past he quietened his voice, obviously not wanting her to hear what he was saying. This man was wearing a coat, and the description was similar to the one that the guy running from Jill's was reported to have been wearing. At 11.45am, what is probably the same man was spotted at a bus stop, still really near to Jill's house which raises more questions for me. If this was the guy that killed Jill or was involved in her death, why was he still in the area 13 minutes after he shot her? This witness was able to give a clear description of the man. He said he was about 5 foot 9, 5 foot 10, with almost a foreign looking nose and a mark on the bridge of his nose as if he wore glasses. The witness got on the bus and left the dark haired man in a suit who was sweating profusely at the bus stop. A minute later, at 11.46am, the number 74 bus pulled up and the man got on it. At 11.55, the man got off at Putney Bridge Station, but from there, no one knows where the man went next. The police released an effort of the man at the bus stop, but say there's every possibility he had nothing to do with the murder, which I feel is a big possibility. But at the same time, he may have been so confident that he hadn't been spotted that he felt he had no reason to leave the area so quickly. Who knows? That's really all the police had to go on. Now, with absolutely zero suspects, on the 19th of April 2000, police made another crime watch appeal. This time they had even more witnesses. The two Mondays before Jill's death, a man was seen standing near the start of Gowan Avenue for at least 40 minutes the first time and at least 20 minutes the second time. Then, on the 21st of April, just five days before Jill's murder, the man was spotted again and was reported to have looked down when the witness walked past, almost in an attempt to hide his face. On the morning of the 26th of April, the same man was seen hanging around Gowan Avenue, wearing a trilby hat and a really ill-fitting suit, according to the witness. The same man was spotted about half ten that morning. As reported in the first Crime Watch appeal, there was a man hanging around the end of Gowan Avenue at about 11.30am just before the murder. Now these descriptions are slightly different. The one seen at half 11 wasn't wearing a trilby hat, but it's completely plausible that he'd just taken it off at some point in that hour. The descriptions are all so similar that it makes it seem likely that this was the same person. Every witness described him as being between 30 and 40, being agitated, wearing a suit that some said was far too big for him, and everyone said that he was either holding his phone or talking to someone on it. In this appeal, DCI Hamish Campbell said that there would be something odd about the killer. He said that he'd be alone, either emotionally or physically isolated, not married and had difficulty with previous relationships. This appeal brought in more than 400 phone calls and gave police 200 new names, with 20 of them being considered relevant or interesting. There are several theories surrounding Jill's murder and I'm going to quickly dive into a few of them for you. Ultimately, police believe that this was a lone murderer, probably slightly odd, who had an obsession with Jill but they couldn't ignore the fact that this looked like a professional hit. Due to her work on Crime Watch, police thought maybe it was an organised crime. Her co-presenter, Nick Ross, was convinced that her murder had no connection to the show. Police also thought this was unlikely, but still they looked into every case that Jill had broadcast on Crime Watch. 
but they found no evidence that any criminals that appeared on Crime Watch had been involved in her murder. Rumours then started spreading that Jill had not just been murdered, but assassinated. The day after the murder, the BBC received a call saying, quote, Yesterday I called you to tell you to add a few more numbers to the list, because your government, and in particular your Prime Minister Blair, murdered and butchered 17 young people. He butchered, we butchered back. The first one you had yesterday, the next one will be Tony Hall, end quote. Tony Hall, now Lord Hall, was the BBC's director of news at the time. Security was immediately amped up around him and his family was moved to a secret location. The speculation around all of this was that the murder was committed by Serbians as revenge for the NATO bombing of the radio television of Serbia headquarters on the 23rd of April 1999, just three days before Jill's murder. Another call was received the next day, which is believed to have been from the same Eastern European man. Quote, Listen, you at the BBC are the voice of your government. That's why your reporter is dead, because your government killed 17 innocent people. End quote. This is a theory that still to this day people talk about and seriously consider as a motive for Jill's murder. The Serbians had been reported to say that the bombing had killed their version of Jill Dando, so was it almost tit for tat? The Serbians were known to murder journalists, with a Serbian journalist being shot in the head just two weeks before Jill was murdered. In 2009, police received a tip about a British criminal of Serbian descent who is now living in the Midlands. Former business associates of the man alleged that he'd played a role in Jill's murder. The man fit the profile, he had a history of violence, and he had experience with guns and a potential link to Arkan, who was a former paramilitary Serbian leader. This man once claimed that his cousin was a driver for Arkan. He denied any involvement in the murder and was actually removed from the inquiry pretty quickly after police found proof that he was in Macedonia at the time of the murder. And that's really the last proper lead or intelligence surrounding the possibility of the link to Serbia. 250 days after the murder, the police were still no further forward with the investigation. Despite 2,000 people named as potential suspects, none of the leads they had panned out. A year after her murder, the police began to think that this was the work of one person. In his notes from the 28th of February 2000, DCI Hamish Campbell said, quote, I return to the loner, the infatuated, the psychopath, the disturbed or the obsessed. They are all equally capable of planning, good luck, and an ability to hurt and harm. My own notes show that this is the most likely explanation. The witness evidence of 26th and earlier days show a man loitering in the street. Can it really be possible that this is 10 or 15 different men, or one man seen through different witness eyes, and thus explains the various discrepancies? Not only have we not seen one piece of evidence or information to show Dando was subject of a contract killing, the location of her death points away from contract. Miss Dando did not live at 29 Gowan Avenue, she lived in Chiswick. Her attendance at Gowan Avenue was sporadic. It is not the location anyone would choose, because there is simply no guarantee or knowledge that she would appear. This is highly pertinent. However, the loner would be taking the random chance. The man was on foot before the attack. He left on foot. As Adrian West says, it tends to point towards someone who is on foot anyway and close enough to reach the Gowan Avenue address. Otherwise, why not Chiswick? Who is this man we seem to have missed? Because I believe we have. What of the odd person with a hat and dots on it? A man in the street or junction on three occasions before the 26th in the street at two locations on the 26th. His clothing matches the man leaving the scene. He had a phone on two separate occasions. Is he the madman or the contract killer, or neither? His behaviour matches more that of the loner than a contract killer. End quote. Not long after DCI Hamish Campbell wrote that, Barry Bolsara came into the inquiry and very quickly became the police's prime suspect. Little did they know he was actually among all the information that had flooded in in the earlier days. An organisation who supported people with disabilities gave Barry's name to police. 
The police did have plans to interview and rule out Barry, but this never happened, probably just because they had so many other names to investigate. Barry was reported to have been acting weird the day after the murder, apparently trying to create an alibi for the previous morning when Jill was shot. There was a weakness in the police's system at the time and there wasn't an effective method of cross-referencing information. Also, they probably wouldn't have been able to cross-reference information very easily because they actually had different names coming in for the same person. Barry Bolsara is how he was originally reported, but his real name is Barry George, so police weren't able to connect the dots straight away. Police do recognise that this was a failure, that the significance of the information wasn't realised sooner. In Hamish's notes, he says, I have re-examined in detail all that we know of this subject. Some of it has come too slowly to my attention. George represents and answers many of the questions and problems with this investigation. It is therefore essential that he is either eliminated or implicated as quickly as possible. We are one year behind him. Before I go any further, I just want to tell you a bit about Barry George and his background. He definitely wasn't unknown to police and had several run-ins with the law before Joe's murder. In 1980, he failed to get into the Metropolitan Police, so he cut up his rejection letter and made it into a warrant card imposed as a policeman, for which he was charged and prosecuted. In June of 1981, he was charged with two counts of indecent assault, where he was acquitted of indecent assault against one woman, but convicted of indecent assault against another. For this, he received a three-month sentence that was suspended for two years. On the 10th of January 1983, Barry George had been found in the grounds of Kensington Palace, which at the time was home to Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Barry was found hiding in the grounds, wearing a balaclava, holding a poem he had written to Prince Charles. In March 1983, he was convicted at the Old Bailey for the February 1982 attempted rape of a woman in Acton. On the 2nd of May 1989, Barry married a Japanese student at Fulham Registry Office. Barry's wife, Itsuko Toid, described the marriage as convenient, but nonetheless violent and terrifying. After four months in September of 1989, Itsuko reported to the police that Barry had assaulted her and on the 29th of October he was arrested and charged, but the case was dropped and they divorced in April 1990. In April 1990 and again in January 1992, Barry was arrested and charged with indecent assault, but neither case were ever brought to court. An officer was assigned to speak to Barry George and as soon as they interviewed him, they began to consider him more and more as a suspect. He had all the previous arrests and convictions for attempted rape and indecent assault, and whilst this doesn't make him a killer, it's certainly suspicious behaviour. When they searched Barry's home, more information came to light, and they found material that led police to become more and more concerned about who it was that had come into their inquiry. They found lots of rolls of undeveloped, old-fashioned camera film, which when the police got developed, they found that there were hundreds of photos of women walking around Fulham. He also had notes of car numbers of people that lived in the street or nearby, names and addresses and maps of where other women lived in the area. He had old cuttings of Jill Dando and some magazines Jill was on the front cover of. He had an interest in guns and had a holster for a gun, old business cards for firearms dealers and in the undeveloped footage film there was a photo of him taken by someone else holding a semi-automatic starting gun. Forensic scientists had deemed a year earlier that the gun that was used to kill Jill was a semi-automatic handgun. While everything they found didn't specifically incriminate Barry and Jill's murder, it was all circumstantial evidence to link him to the crime scene in the surrounding area. All the evidence from Barry's home was sent for a forensic investigation. Amongst Barry's things, they found a three-quarter length coat, and the man seen running away from Jill's house at the murder was wearing a coat very similar in description. They sent the coat off to see if they could find any forensic trace on it, looking for gunshot powder residue or any blood spatter that would have come from the gunshot wound. When the coat was examined, they found a small particle of gunshot residue in the inside pocket of the coat. 
The gunshot residue contained the same elements of lead, barium and antimony as the gunshot residue found on the cartridge case and in Jill's hair near the gunshot wound. Police arrested Barry George on the suspicion of Jill's murder on the 25th of May 2000, just over a year after her death. He was taken to Hammersmith Police Station where he was questioned. When Barry made his statement, he was very clear what he was doing and where he was the day Jill was murdered, but once he was arrested and questioned by police, his account changed. He also told police that he had never bought, owned or fired a firearm, which made the police more suspicious of him as they knew they'd found gunshot residue on the inside pocket of a coat found at his house. The police gathered all the evidence, the gunshot residue in his coat pocket being chemically the same as the gunshot residue found in Jill's hair, the fact that he was acting suspicious in the days following the murder and was trying to leave the area and come up with an alibi, the photo of him holding the same type of handgun that they believed was used to shoot Jill and the coat he owned matching the description of the coat the man was wearing as he left the scene of the murder and sent it all to CPS to be considered. On the 29th of May 2000, just four days after his arrest and exactly 369 days after Jill's murder, Barry George was charged with the murder of Jill Dando. Before his trial began, Barry George was diagnosed with Asperger's. Prosecution psychologists also diagnosed him with several different personality disorders, antisocial, histrionic, narcissistic and possibly paranoid, as well as somatization, a factitious disorder and ADHD. So just a few definitions as I didn't know what some of these words meant. I apologise if you guys know the definition, but I figured if I didn't, there would be others that didn't either. So, histrionic personality disorder is characterised by excessive attention-seeking emotions that usually begin in childhood, including inappropriate seductive behaviour and an excessive need for approval. Wikipedia describes somatisation as a tendency to experience and communicate psychological called distress in the form of somatic symptoms and to seek medical help for them. More commonly expressed, it is the generation of physical symptoms of a psychiatric condition such as anxiety. Finally, a factitious disorder is a condition in which a person, without malicious intentions, acts as if they have an illness by deliberately producing or exaggerating symptoms to become a patient. The trial began on the 26th of February 2001 at the Old Bailey in London, almost two years after Jill's murder, and lasted about 52 days. The prosecution's case was heavily based on the gunshot residue in the coat pocket and witnesses that thought they saw Barry George leaving the scene. However, these two witnesses failed to pick him out of a lineup. The jury deliberated for five days and on the 2nd of July 2001, Barry George was found guilty of Jill Dando's murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Barry appealed his conviction a year into serving his sentence, but on the 29th of July 2002, his appeal was denied and his conviction was upheld. Four years later, in 2006, his legal team made a submission to the Criminal Cases Review Commission who basically review any cases where the legal party puts forward any grounds that they think could mean the conviction was unsafe. The appeal was made due to new evidence that Barry was unable to commit the crime due to his mental disabilities and illnesses. The defence brought in a neuropsychiatrist who concluded that he was not calculating enough to have committed the crime. The Criminal Cases Review Commission felt that by mid-2006, there was a change in policy by the Forensic Science Service, which would change the significance of the weight that was put on the single particle of gunshot residue. Angela Shaw, a forensic scientist whose area of expertise is in gunshot residue, said that in the case of the particle found in the coat pocket, it would now be classed as a type 2 gunshot residue particle. The particles found in the coat and the ones found in Jill's hair were indistinguishable from each other. Therefore, the casing could have been the source of the particle in Barry's coat. But there was a key question that hadn't been asked at the trial. 
What was the significance of a single particle in a coat pocket a year after a shooting? Angela suggested that they estimate that one in a hundred people may pick up a gunshot residue particle from people such as armed police officers or hobby shooters on public transport. So whilst it's rare it can happen, which is why now they put no weight on a single particle. A single particle, a year later in a coat pocket, could not link Barry George to the shooting. On the 22nd of August 2007, the Criminal Case Review Commission referred the case to the Court of Appeal. Barry was refused bail prior to the hearing, which began on the 5th of November 2007. The Court of Appeal found the gunshot residue inconclusive and on the 15th of November they quashed Barry George's conviction. A retrial was ordered and the single particle of gunshot residue was deemed inadmissible. Barry appeared before the Old Bailey on the 14th of December 2007 where he pled not guilty to Jill's murder and his retrial started on the 9th of June 2008. The defence reminded the jury that three separate women from Hafad placed Barry's arrival at their office the day of the murder between 11.50am and 12pm, which according to the defence made it impossible for Barry to have shot Jill at half 11 and then gone home to get changed before arriving at Hafad just before 12. The neighbour who most definitely saw Jill's killer also failed to identify Barry George at an identification parade. On the 1st of August 2008, Barry George was found not guilty of Jill Dando's murder. Sadly, he was wrongfully convicted and imprisoned for eight years. Without the gunshot residue, all they had was circumstantial evidence, which didn't link him at all to Jill's murder. And that's pretty much where the case stands. There have been no new suspects or leads and honestly I suspect we may never find out who killed Jill Dando. I honestly have no idea what to think of it all. I keep going back to the Serbians, it seems likely that they might have decided to kill a famous British journalist as revenge. I also go back to the witness at the bus stop who described the man he saw as having a foreign looking nose. But then again I'm not really sure what a foreign looking nose means. I feel like if it was a revenge attack, the Serbians would probably have claimed it as their own. I think it's highly possible that Jill had a stalker. At the end of the day, she was on so many TV screens and was loved by so many across the UK. Maybe a stalker was so infatuated that when she announced her engagement to Alan, they couldn't handle it. And it was a, if I can't have you, no one can kind of situation. But then, if someone were that deluded, I'm not sure they'd have the capacity to commit such a perfect murder and get away with it for 20 years. Something I also go back to is the man or men seen at Gowan Avenue before, at the time and after the murder. Could this really be a coincidence? I want to say it wasn't. A part of me thinks that there were two men, one in the Range Rover, one scoping out the place, then one committing the murder and one acting as a lookout, one wearing a coat, one not both running away from the scene. But why were they hanging around the scene 15 minutes after the shooting? Honestly, this case is one that could absolutely drive you crazy going round and round in circles. But the truth is, we have no idea what the significance of the men is, what the significance of the running men is, what the significance of the Range Rover is. And a part of me thinks we never will. We're 20 years on and we haven't got any answers. This was such a high profile case if someone held the answers and wanted to come forward. I think they would have by now. But anyway, if you lived in Fulham in April of 1999, specifically near Gowan Avenue, if you owned a dark blue Range Rover and were driving around Fulham on the 26th of April 1999, If you were a businessman or a salesperson hanging around Gowan Avenue on the 26th of April 1999. If you were a dark haired man wearing a suit running to catch the bus because you were late for a meeting at about 11.40am on the 26th of April 1999. If you are any of these people or you know who any of these people are or may be or you have any information related to Jill's murder, please do the right thing and contact the Metropolitan Police and tell them what you know. Jill's brother, 
cousins, family, colleagues and friends, including Sir Cliff Richard, are desperate to know why their beloved family member and friend was murdered in such a brutal way. Let's give them the closure they need. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. Have a great week and I'll see you all next week for another episode.